morning and warm welcome to online anesthesia a postgraduate teaching program on zoom platform sponsored by acrola and hosted by a1 logics this is the first time it is going to be aired by the anesthesia tv also today we have two topics for first year postgraduates and a video demo for on echo it is useful for the practitioners also so the first topic is anatomy and physiology of pain by dr parsa saradi He is working as a professor in Mahatma Gandhi Medical College Research Institute and Puducherry. His academic achievements is, are innumerable. Difficult to enumerate everything here. He has presented around 145 research papers in reputed journals with 475 citations. And he is the associate editor of Indian Journal of Anesthesia. And he has created an, his own website, Pain Free Partha, for the benefits of the postgraduates. And he is conducting Friday. Anesthesia continuing education via Zoom as a Fridays at every Friday 6 p.m. and he received many awards and he released eight Tamil poetry books and he is a great Tamil scholar too. So over to Professor Patu Sir. Thank you very much. Whenever I talk anything on academics, I put a big salute to the legendary teacher of two centuries, Professor Ravi Shankar. Who is currently the director of e-learning in MDMC RI? So, what is my talk is going to go about like definition, pathway, taxonomy. Some patho pathological terms and meanings, the descending control of pain, and practice spells linking physiology, anatomy, and pharmacology. What is the definition of pain? So, a little older definition, but it is it is staying still. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. See here, it's not only sensory; it's an ex emotional experience. It is unpleasant. It is associated with actual or potential tissue damage, actual damage or potential tissue damage. It cannot be too also described in terms of such damage. So it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, or described in terms of such damage. Some say an unpleasant sensation occurring in varying degrees of severity. As a consequence of injury, disease, or emotion, pain has always got a subjective component. So this is uh, Professor M R Rajagopal. He says pain is something which hurts. So what is nociception? What I understood is nociception is activation of a nociceptor, a potentially tissue damage, the noxious stimulus. Is the first step in the pathway. Some damage is done, and probably I think the emotional or the affective component is not there. It's a sensory component which makes no detection. For example, right rat tail clamp. That is a form of nociception. A nociceptor is a specialized neurological receptor capable of differentiating between. Noxious and noxious stimulus. What we have is A delta and C fibers. Now, how is pain perceived? Now we know A delta fibers and C fibers. This is myelinated. This is unmyelinated. So this is diameter we can see here. This is so this is myelinated. Yes, and unmyelinated. This is for first pain and this is for the second pain. So pain starts by the nociceptors here, and then it travels along from the A delta C fibers to the dorsal horn, and from there it synapses in the second order neurons of substantia gelatinosa, and from there it ascends contralaterally other side and goes in this side, and it reaches the thalamus, spinal thalamic tract, and from there. The thalamocortical projections. Yes. 
posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Paleospinothalamic neurons known as the C fibers. Neo abding another more of A delta fibers. From the thalamus, the third order neurons to the cortex. And the cortex, we can have anterior cingulate cortex, the emotional aspect, and the somatosensory cortex, the actual noxious painful sensory cortex. Now, that is also the second order neurons. From here, this is the first nerve and noxious stimulus. From there, the first order neurons. Synapse here. The spinothalamic tract goes above. From this, the third order neurons. The thalamocortical projection system into the cingulate cortex and the somatosensory cortex. But it is not the only thing. Sometimes we can have spino mesencephalic. Mesencephalic, then midbrain. So behavioral responses to pain. Spino reticular system, reticular formation, motivational aspects, all these things are also there. So from there, first, from the dorsal horns, first are neurons, lateral spinothalamic tract, thalamus, and the cortex. Also, we have spino reticular and spino mesencephalic. As I'm again telling you, this is the pathway of first order neurons, the second order neurons. And the third are neurons. So, what is, we will, this is the basic anatomy of pain. So, we will go to what are the, some specific terms associated with pain. Patient has no pain, but he has got the noxious stimulus. That is what is called analgesia. Patient has pain, but there is no painful stimulus. Then it is not called analgesia. Anesthesia means all sensory modalities are gone. While analgesia means only pain in the Paresthesia means abnormal sensation. Either it may be spontaneous or evoke. We can evoke a paresthesia or it may come as an abnormal sensation in paresthesia. It may be either painful or painless. Painful paresthesia is sometimes called desisthesia. Formification leave of this. Now we have one more term called anesthesia dolorosa. Anesthesia and all sensory modalities are gone. Dolorosa and pain. All sensory nerve is gone. Still we have pain in that area. That is what is called anesthesia dolorosa. You just ablate the trigeminal nerve. There is no sensation. If you touch, we cannot feel. But this, the neurologic shooting pain comes. This is called anesthesia dolorosa. Hyperpathia refers to an abnormally intense response we are repetitive stimulus. Algogens, algona, algesia, and pain, analgesia, and pain relief. Algogens, na pain generators. What are these pain generators? Histamines, substance B, potassium, prostaglandins, bradykinins, serotonins, etc. When injected, also it produces no. So, what is hyperalgesia? Now you have a stimulus. This is the normal pain response. If the pain response is more, then it is called hyperalgesia. The shift it to the left and not right. The shift it to the left. Pain to a non-noxious stimulus in the injury. Sometimes pharyngitis swallowing painful. That is called allodynia, non-noxious stimulus. So there is something called primary hyperalgesia and secondary hyperalgesia. It starts within minutes on the area of injury. This is to do peripheral sensitization. Peripheral nerves, nosis septarla, there is some change. So small pain stimulus, big pain is sensed. That is sensitization. So secondary delayed onset, wider area, only thermal stimulus, and there may be a central. Primary hyperalgesia, there are so many mechanisms, camp levels and PKCs have been explained. Antidromic release of algogens, dorsal horn neurons become sensitive. Wide dynamic neurons, WDR neurons, there are some plastic changes. Sometimes they are irreversible. Now, what is sensitization? We all told. Hyperalgesia is due to sensitization. It 
the stimulus to pain is more means the shift to the curve is left. Then it is called hyperalgesia. The fiber response is more than it is called sensitization. This is more of an electrical sensitization. That is more of a clinical hyperalgesia. So it is a peripheral receptor or a central response, more intense fashion. So occur, it can occur in the nose receptor in the periphery or it can occur in the spinal cord. So this is about the various terms what we have. Hyperalgesia, hyperpathia, allodynia, anorexia dolorosa, sensitization, so many terms. Allodynia means there is no painful stimulus. Touch a patient with pain. So these are all some of the terms. Now we go to classify. The pain. Why do we need to classify the pain? We need to understand the where from it has come from and the treatment modalities. From there we can judge the prognosis. So if you want to go as a temporal classification, acute, just you have a trauma, elbow injury, knee injury. It's an acute pain, acute gastritis. Chronic pains, it persists for more than three months. For example, the patient has got an intercostal neuralgia, postherpetic neuralgia. Recurrent means the ordinal ulcer. There are other classifications according to the etiology, according to the site. I'm a first NSMO classification according to the temporal, time based. Acute, sometimes subacute, around three weeks. More than three months is chronic. Now we have a classification depending upon the etiology. It's an arthritic, a malignant pain. Where is the pain like? From the appendix, from the breast. This is one type of taxon. What is more important is whether it is a nociceptive pain or a non nociceptive pain. Nociceptive, nana? Noxious stimulus is there. Somatic nociception. If you have a trauma, injury, if you have some paronychia, pus in the nail bed, that is somatic nociceptive. Visceral means there is appendicitis. Non nociceptive is neuropathic, central, and psychogenic. There is no noxious stimulus. Nociceptive somatic, yes, we know two things. Very simple. Example, it increased with movements, dull or sharp, localized. Now we can have so many examples of nociceptive somatic pain. Yes, visceral nociception, renal pain, appendix pain, autonomic sensations will be there, nausea, vomiting, sweating, especially with visceral nociception. Neuropathic means, yes, burning, electrical, sometimes numbing. The intervening period is normal. Certain areas, just a burning sensation. For half an hour, then it becomes normal. Intervening period is normal. That is not there with no susceptive stimulus. Sudden, post-herpetic, trigeminal, glossopharyngeal, neural yes. Now we have central pain syndrome. is a neurological condition. If a tumor, stroke, Parkinson's disease. This side stroke means they will have complete pain. Continuously, they will have pain. This is very difficult to treat. There are a lot of theories which have been proposed for this neuropathic pain. Specific cellular and molecular changes that affect membrane excitability. New gene expression after nerve injury. So many things. For example, ectopic impulses of neuroma. Changes of sodium calcium channel. So many things have been proposed for Neuropathic pain. Psychogenic pain. What we have now is nociceptive, somatic, visceral. Non nociceptive, peripheral or neuropathic, central, post traumatic pain, stroke pain, all these things. Psychogenic pain means they are mental, emotional, behavioral factors. Headache, backache, some of the common causes of psychogenic pain. Eurosocial rejection. Emotional event, grief, all these things will be there, but there is no nociception, no neuropathic mechanism. So these are never acute. Psychogenic pain is usually chronic. 
So what are the so many theories of pain have been come? So Aristotle believed that pain was due to evil spirits entering the body. It was due to an imbalance in vital fluids. It was thought as a punishment from God. So is a disturbance passed, which passed along to the brain. So specificity theory. Body has got a separate sensory system for perceiving pain. A hearing core sensory system, vision core sensory system. Pain is a separate sensory system. This is what is the first thing we started that there is something separate for the pain. Pattern theory. He said there is no special sensory. If you, if there is a pattern difference, something called, if you have touch or pattern of sensation. Pain, there is some pattern. This is what is called a pattern. Intensivity theory, na mama. If you slightly touch, it will be touched. If you touch it hard, it will be seen as pain. That is what is called the intensity. We will go to Melzack wall gate control theory. Pain stimulation is carried by small slow fibers, which already we have done. A delta. We are not targeting A alpha or anything. Specific nerve fibers, yes, okay. Now. The small fiber where pain is going, transmission patient is having. Now this is there is one gate. This is inhibited by this. This further inhibits so that the pain is more. But if large fiber is stimulated, this closes the gate and substantia gelatinosa is stimulated so that the transmission is decreased. This is what is called as the gate control theory. Of Melzack wall. So the gate opens and closes. This is what is the thing. If the large fibers remain unstimulated, large fiber become not stimulated, pain signal will be continuously thin and so that the patient will have pain. Now see here, there is a pain, headache. It is going on, patient is having a headache. Now we put some bomb. We are stimulating the large fiber. This large fiber is stimulating the substantia gelatinosa plus, and the substantia gelatinosa is inhibiting. So SG acts as a gate to decrease the pain by just posing as zanduban. So now we have one more thing: patient itch and pain get at the same fiber. Now we have got itching, and it's now what we do is scratching. Now, maybe by scratching, we decrease itching. We are not doing anything on histamine or anything like that. We are stimulating the large diameter fibers plus substantia gelatinosa. The simple example of gate control theory. So, what is the neuromatrix? How does it work? So, there are a lot of things which cannot be explained by the gate control theory. So, the neuromatrix consists of multiple areas within the central nervous system, brain thalamus, limbic system, prefrontal areas, spinal cord, etc. They work together to produce a pain signature. This is what makes one to feel pain. This is what is called the neuromatrix theory. Only peripheral signals cannot elicit pain signature. So it has to be the impulse causing a Together of all these things, limbic system, but not an affective component because otherwise, only sensory component. So, all these things is what is called the neuro signature. Now, this is biosocial psychological theory or biological factor, for example, tissue health or social factor, economic status, social learning, social support or psychological factor. Catastrophic thinking, hypervigilance, depression, anxiety, anger, bio socio psychological model of pain. So, for example, now we have a wound. This wound is causing pain, and a neuropathy is there. This also causes pain. This is biological. This is followed by patient is a depression and mental agony. This is psychological. Now, or he or she will be treated as a social outcast. 
were in HIV. So, bio, psycho, social, all these factors play a part in, in, in HIV. This is what is called biosocial psychological model of thing. Now, we will go to the descending influence. What is this descending control? Now, we know from the nocis of tar prostaglandins, histamines, algogens are stimulated. It stimulates the peripheral nerves. It goes through the dorsal horn, lateral, all these things we know. This is what is called the ascending pathway of pain. Something called the descending country. We have rostromedial medial nucleus, periaqueductal gray, the dorsal root ganglion, cortex. From there, there are a lot of things which passes into the DRG. This is what is called the descending control. Pain modulation in particular, the inhibitory modulation, what is called the endogenous analgesia. If you pain stimulate the descending control and the pain decrease. This is what is called pain inhibiting pain. From where the modulation? Thalamus, hypothalamus, pain stem. There are two, three things. Locus cerureus. Here you can see the locus cerureus. Nucleus raphe magnus. Here is NRM. Nucleus tractus solitorius, here it is. Periaqueductal gray, here it is. So these are all the sites of possible areas or sites of descending modulation. How we came to know that there is something like that? For part of the brain, if you give stimulation, then it causes analgesia. Brainstem stimulation causes analgesia. If you stimulate a brainstem nucleus, it influences the dorsal gun to decrease pain. That is how we found out that there is something called descending control of pain. So normally opioids, noradrenaline, serotonin is involved. But now they have found out even GABA is involved. Modulation means inhibition and also sometimes facilitation by the way of good. What I want to specify descending control is an exam question. Periaqueductal gray. Opioids, okay, locus ceruleus, noradrenaline, this is serotonin, nucleus raphe magnus, the prime chemical, periaqueductal gray opioids, this is norepinephrine in locus ceruleus, raphe magnus, NRS, nucleus raphe magnus, midbrain, pons, and this forms the brain stump, so ONS, PLR, opium, Noradrenaline, serotonin, periaqueductal gray, locus ceruleus, and nucleus raphe magnus. There is also called something called descending modulation of pain, the GABA, yes, that increases GABA by and decreases pain. It is also there in the descending modulation. Synthetic, non synthetic cannabinoid drugs. They also influence the PAG and also the RVM neurons, thereby control the descending modulation. TRPV1 receptors, transient receptor potential vanillot type 1 and NO vanilloids. This is where our capsaicin works. Capsaicin, if you do like this, so it causes a burning sensation and it depletes substance P, thereby causing analgesia. So, this is one of the causes of descending. Great paracetamol. They also say there is something called periaqueductal gray. It stimulates the role of opioids in the bag. So, it also stimulates GABA. All these things have been found out with paracetamol. This is my article, effect of addition of intrathecal metazolum. So, spinal and supraspinal metazolum. It potentiates morphine induced an agent induced energy say. GABA mimetic in the metasol of the action. But spinal supra spinal it potentiates mark. That is opioid like has got influence. Opioid stimulate pack that we know. Very critical gray opioids. There is also a GABA pathway. Yes, contribution of pain in opioid tolerance. There is a small difference in tremodol because it also acts on the mu receptor and it also acts on the monoamine reuptake, serotonin, norepinephrine, thereby the descending pain is modulated. Yes, we all think that clonidine 
release of norepinephrine descending bulbospinal neurons binds to the alpha receptor sympathetic outflow is decreased that is when we give iv or im what does it do when we give it increases the action of opioids it causes vasoconstriction this is more of an action when we give clonidin into the spinal while we give parenterally it is alpha receptor decreased afferent pain what we thought was tense transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation if you keep the tense paddles here and if you give a stimulation it is likely to work like a gate control theory and causes pain relief now they say this pain relief is also due to a descending because contralateral stimulate if you stimulate the left hand there is a decrease in pain in the left hand right hand how does it possible so if you are going only by the gate control theory <coughs> there is some GABA changes, there is some interference changes. <coughs> Electroacupuncture. It has been demonstrated that electroacupuncture also we thought it is great control theory. No, it has got some action on nucleus raphe magnus. 5 HT can serotonin and also in locus cereus is descending systems. Previously, it was thought as only ascending systems. We have gotten, this is our article, post-stroke pain with acupuncture. Chronic primary pain is a new group of diseases with long-term pain and functional disorders. Without CN, fibromyalgia, temporomandibular disorders, there, this duloxetine venula flux, they have got increased serotonin level in the prefrontal cortex and thereby they influence and in control of pain. Yes, they have now found out chronification of pain. Acute pain becomes chronic. I will take in one more class what is how they transform acute pain into chronic pain. Transition, how does it occur? That's a diff completely different topic. Descending pain modulation. If you want to go in a psychogenic angle, Disruption of endogenous pain modulation by chronic pain alters cognitive and emotional processing. Yes, we thought all these things are due to spine and mesoencephalic tracts causing in the, what they say is a neural signature, neuromatrix involving the limbic system. But now they say even in the psychogenic pain, there is a role of descending modulation. Dysfunction of the central inhibition of pain has been influenced as chronic pain. But we think otherwise. There are a lot of manual theories and we know descending modulation in so many manual theories. Manual and manipulative theory, knee joint manipulation, ankle joint mobilization, all these things previously we thought ascending only. But now they have got control in descending control. Micro C. On steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, brufen, diclofenac are supposed to act periphery on the pain site, but now they also micro injections in the periaqueductal produces they release endogenous opioids. Some NSIDs do they have a role in descending pain? Now we go to clinical diamonds. Why should acute pain produce a sympathetic response? BP rays are who, but fate rays are. The chronic pain does not. Now I have a ascending and descending modulation system. It is quite not it's a roughly drawn, I'd say. If a site of pain, here there is an injury. From here it goes, crosses and goes above and here, and there is a descending modulation. Now, if this is a site of pain, injury, now we can give local anesthetic here. Or we can give NSAIDs parenterally, or NSAIDs parenterally so that prostaglandins and other algogens stimulation is decreased. Now it courses through the dorsal nerve, dorsal root ganglion enters the spinal cord. Here we can give a block and then it goes to the ascending pathways. We can have neuroxial, epidural, spinal. We can have, yes, here we can have alpha-2 receptors and clonidine. 
in the pack we can have opioids it also acts in the descending modulation system fluoridin acts here also and here also do not set in it cuts the neuro there is a we have already told there are some wide dynamic rodents there is a role of 5-HT in the descending modulation. So do not set in is can cause decreased neuropathic pain and also descending modulation of pain is affected. Paracetamol is centrally acting and also some role in periaqueductal clearing. Ketamine, where is it act? Thalamocortical projection system. That is where it cuts down the NMDA. Psychological, as I have told, anterior cingulate cortex, where we can change. So this is about a simple diagram of how many drugs compete and act in many places of the ascending and the descending path of pain. So if you want to do a summary, as yes, definition, it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Classification may be acute, subacute, and chronic or where is it arthritic or malignant or appendix or anything like that or nociceptive or non-nociceptive nociceptive whether is somatic and visceral non-nociceptive whether is neuropathic central and psychiatric in the theories first is a specificity theory intensity theory pattern theory gate control theory neuromatrix theory and biopsychosocial theories we all know the descending influence from the PAG, opioids, periaqueductal gray, locus ceruleus, and nucleus raphe magnus, the role of noradrenaline and serotonin. As I've already drawn a diagram to tell what are the clinical pearls are targeting drug therapy in very simple terms. There are so much in pain therapy, I'm not going into newer analytics. So are we ascending too much? Can we listen slightly, look down and look into these settings? So thank you very much, Master Sir. Uh, we will move on to the second topic. If there is any questions, we will take up the questions in the end of the session. So the second topic is the pharmacology of opioids by Dr. Sir Prasad. He is working as the Astronaut Professor in the Institute of Anesthesiology, Madhuri Medical College. He is one of the pillars of our online anesthesia. His lectures are very popular among the postgraduates. His field of interest is cardiac anesthesia and teaching basics for the postgraduates. Over to you, Mr. Prasad, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, all. And after hearing some topic, uh, some good lecture on pain, I think we have to uh, start with the uh, analgesic uh, also. So thank you for this topic. Uh, I'll tell you why I have put this uh, my myotic pupil in this uh, picture in the, in the last slide if there is time. Uh, as Thomas Sittenham rightly told, among the remedies which has pleased Almighty to give man to relieve his suffering, man is so universal and so efficacious as opium. So from the day of uh, uh, opium being used as an analgesic till today, it has been very useful and also been more abused. So into, what are we going to learn today? As usual, we'll slightly give uh, credit to our contributors in this uh, analgesic field. Then we'll learn a few things about structure of OPIs so that we remember how they are classified based on, on the source and structure. We'll also look on how opioid receptors behave when they are uh, bound with the ligand so that we can understand how the classification is based on activity on receptors. We also look into the pharmacodynamics so that we understand the uh, uh, structure and activity of the mu uh, agonists, pharmacokinetics on how we choose these drugs and pharmacology of commonly used to say, I'm not going to talk about all the drugs because you will go into narcosis. We'll look at, into the pharmacology of some commonly used but less read drugs. And uh, additionally, if I have time, I'll uh, cover novel delivery systems in the opioids, genetic variation and how these opioids effects varies from among individuals and a new field of uh, uh, interest called biased agonism. So let us move on to the topic. So it was in uh, 3rd century BC, look at the time, it is very, very old. Uh, Theophrates writing said uh, uh, uses of opium. And in olden days, more than its uh, analgesic property, they were used as anti-diarrheals. It was in 600 
1600, the para Celsius, he has uh, produced this tincture of laudanum, which contained mixture of alkaloids, which relieved pain. And in uh, 1680, uh, Thomas Edenham purified this laudanum and used its extract as an analgesic proper. It was in 1806, Sertner, a pharmacist, isolated morphine from opium. This is the starting point of uh, the active pharmacology of the opium alkaloids. And uh, in 1874, heroin was the first synthetic opiate to be synthesized. Here I have to uh, talk, tell about somebody called Beecher in Lucknow. He, uh, he was a, a military man. He observed that people dif uh, behave differently in the wound when they are wounded in the war field than in the clinical settings. Uh, so he described the neurohumoral relationship of the opioids. And in later in, uh, in the later years, in 1970s, he described the agonist antagonist activity of opioids and he discovered nalorphine. It is from that the agonist antagonist activity and the search for different type of opioid receptors started developing. Martin et al. They described the opioid receptors, the mu, kappa, and delta. And now it is uh, uh, IUPAC. Uh, uh, name is given as MOR, KOR, and DOR. And uh, the endogenous analgesic peptides were uh, illustrated in 1975. And latest is in 2006, biased agonism and looking for uh, drugs that have a very, very specific effect that is analgesia without any side effect is being developed. So uh, these uh, opioid uh, uh, chemicals are derived from poppy plant, it is pepper somniferum. The resin contains a lot of alkaloids. They are morphine, codeine, and thebane. So opiates refer to that which are derived from these alkaloids. And opioids means any chemical that has activity on the opioid receptor. It could be endogenous opioid, which are peptides, natural opioids, that is morphine and its derivatives, or synthetic opioids, which we are developing today. So coming to the structure of opioids, so all these chemicals are derived from a basic backbone nucleus called the phenanthrene molecule. It is a 16 carbon atom molecule with a five ring structure. You can see the five rings here. And this is a optically active chiral molecule it means it can, it has an elevatory form and a dextrorotatory form. In nature, all these compounds come in an active levorotatory form. Dextrorotatory form is not there and it's not useful also. And you can see here, there are some targets of substitution, the hydroxyl group on, on the two ends, the, the keto group and the methyl and the hydrogen group are all target substitution so that we can produce newer compounds with better uh, pharmacological profile. Look at this, the, the first benzene ring and the third one, these two together are called the phenylpiperidine nucleus from which the newer agents, the fentanyl, the sufentanyl, everything are developed from this one and three nucleus alone. So this is the morphine molecule, the phenanthrene molecule. If you can change the, the uh, hydroxyl molecule here to into a keto group, you get oxymorphone. If you change it to a methyl group and this hydroxyl, you get codeine. If you combine these two, you get oxycodone. And if you two put two acetyl groups on these hydroxyl molecules, you get heroin. So all this classification is developed because of this backbone phenanthrene nucleus, even the antagonist naloxone and naltrexone are phenanthrene molecules basically with aryl and allyl substitution in the nitrogen atom so that they can act as an antagonist. Coming to the phenylpiperidine nucleus, see you can already told you this one and three uh, 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 rings will uh, provide the backbone. This is the benzene structure with the nitrogen attached one on one side as a methyl and then the other side you have a allyl nucleus. So this is the basic structure of pethidin. Pethidin is a fully synthetic compound out of which many other compounds have been developed. See, if you uh, substitute this methyl with the anilopyridin, you get fentanyl. If you put a sulfur nuclear atom in this, it will become more and more lipid soluble and become sufentanyl. If you can add a oxy group here, it becomes alfentanyl. It gives a, a typically different properties to it. And if you add two ester groups here, which are susceptible to uh, action based traces and quick termination of action, it is called remifentanyl. Now I'm going to put, and these all are together called anilidopyridins. See, I have put another chemical structure here, which has a nitrogen uh, atom here, a methyl group like the same pethidin and a side chain. 
can someone uh, anyone of you identify what this molecule is so that you can understand the some of the physical properties of uh, physiological properties of pethidin you can put that in the chat box this molecule you can identify what it is so based on uh, uh, classification based on source and chemical structure we have natural semi synthetic and synthetic compounds natural are again divided into phenanthrene as we saw phenanthrene and benzyl isoquinolone derivatives benzyl isoquinolone derivatives are not analgesics they are used as either smooth muscle relaxants or antitussis under phenanthrene we have the natural ones morphine codeine and thebaine the semi synthetic derivatives are all derivatives of either morphine codeine or thebaine so from morphine we can get heroin or dihydromorphone the codeine analogs they are not codeine derivatives but they are codeine analogs they are tramadol and tapentidol the thebaine derivatives are etorphine and the buprenorphine the antagonists are naloxone and naloxone so it is easy right so with if you can remember the phenanthrene molecule you can derive the semi synthetic molecules also coming to synthetic so as we also uh, already seen we have phenyl peptide derivatives that is pethidin fentanyl sufentanyl remifentanyl this morphinon derivatives are levorphanol and butorphanol benzomorphone derivatives are pentosozin and phenosozin diphenyl propyl amine derivatives are methadone and propoxyvin you have to uh, by heart these uh, synthetic group only semi synthetic you can easily remember and write in the exam coming to the opioid receptor opioid receptor is a uh, rhodopsin family g protein coupled receptor that is present in the cell membranes so when when a opioid binds to it what happens is it activates a g protein inside the intracellular component the first thing what happens is it, it opens a potassium channel which is invalid rectifying invalid rectifying means what it, it is whatever uh, potassium can either move inward or outward it will hyperpolarize the membrane on the other side it also will inhibit the voltage dependent calcium channel in the presynaptic membrane so calcium entry is prevented this is the main action of an opioid receptor once the opioid binds to it it will either modify the potassium channel in the postsynaptic membrane or close the calcium channel in the presynaptic membrane other effects are it will also inhibit the adrenal cyclase uh, leading to decrease in cyclic amp and mat kinase pathway which will lead to tolerance so this is the basic structure of an opioid receptor which is a seven transmembrane spanning protein which is a g protein coupled receptor so coming to the presynaptic and postsynaptic effects so this is a, a neuron uh, it might be a first order neuron and this in a postsynaptic one would be a, a second order neuron when a pain stimulus comes to in this first order neuron what happens is pain uh, uh, transmitting substances like glutamate substance p and cg uh, reactive peptide will be uh, uh, secreted all this will go to the post receptor and stimulate nmda amp ampa neurokinin uh, receptors and produce acute and uh, long term pain what happens is once the opioid receptor is activated here it will prevent the calcium conductance into this uh, presynaptic neuron and reduce the secretion of glutamate and substance p postsynaptically it will hyperpolarize the membrane and it will reduce the activity of nmda and amp and neurokinin receptors thereby modulating the pain so the the opioid analgesic is not at absolute uh, anesthesia but it's a modulation of pain this uh, depending upon the cloning of uh, opioid receptors they are divided into mu kappa and delta mu is are uh, again classified into mu1 and mu2 depending on what effects it predominates in them so all these receptors have analgesic component mu2 has only spinal component whereas all others have supraspinal component also i'll talk about what is supraspinal component in the next slide and uh, the main side effect of mu2 is depression of ventilation and kappa is dysphoria whereas mu1 produces euphoria mu2 also has physical dependence potential so as you can all see from this uh, stimulating mu1 is beneficial and mu2 is not so beneficial and all these receptors produces some amount of meiosis and constipation is markedly produced with mu2 receptor there is also a diuretic uh, 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 potential for kappa as we can when we go ahead we will see this kappa agonist so they all produce some amount of diuresis when you look at these receptors they are always in a heterodimeric state that is mu receptors will be uh, closely associated with kappa receptors they will be in a one complex that is called 
heterodimerization. So the next classification is depending on how this heterodimerization helps us. So when you talk about a pure agonist, it is always the a mu receptor and kappa receptor which stays together. So the, all these binding uh, uh, agonists, morphine, pethidine, they have potential to stimulate alpha and kappa receptors equally. When it comes to partial agonists, they act on mu receptors specifically and they block the kappa receptors. You can see here, it's only half a molecule high, like how we have heparin and low molecular heparin. This is only half a molecule. It will prevent binding of other substances into the kappa receptor and it will act only as a pure uh, mu receptor and uh, that is why it has got less than effect of uh, the pure morphine. Coming to agonist antagonist class of drugs, they will stimulate the kappa receptor specifically and block the mu receptor. So they are, have got a different type of uh, uh, pharmacological profile. When it comes to antagonists, they block both mu and kappa receptors. So we'll start classifying their drugs from antagonists so that it's easy for us. The pure antagonists are naloxone, naltrexone, and their derivatives, methyl naltrexone, nalmefin, naloxigol, and alvimopan. Remember, naloxone and naltrexone are distributed throughout the body, whereas methyl naltrexone, naloxigol, and alvimopan are peripherally acting antagonists. Coming to agonist antagonists, we have nalbufin, butorphanol, and pentosocin. These three drugs are the named drugs of this class where on the other nalorphine was the first drug which was discovered but it's not in use now desosocin is another drug which is commonly used in china but not here you will have to remember the three drugs nalbufin butorphanol and pentosocin for its effects the only drug which we have as a partial agonist is buprenorphine it binds only to the mu receptor and prevents any other kappa receptor kappa agonist binding to the kappa receptor the pure agonist, now we can write everything else is pure uh, is pure agonist. Morphine, petrin, fentanyl, tramadol, but methrin, all or others are pure agonist. One drug which I want to tell about is meptazinol. This drug, we already saw mu1, mu2. Mu2 has all derogatory effects and mu1 has beneficial effects. Meptazinol is a specific mu1 agonist. So they are double, trying to develop mu1 specific agonist. Though meptazinol has all beneficial effects, it has also got side effects also. Coming to pharmacodynamics, other than that, it's, its original effect, opiates have got variety of effects on the whole body because the mu the opiate receptors are widely distribu distributed. So it has got too many effects. So you will have to manage many things other than analgesia also. Coming to the, the prime effect, analgesia, it is described as modulation of conduction and modification of perception. It occurs at three levels. The first level is peripheral opiate receptors. It has been a recent discovery the, of the existence of peripheral opiate receptors. They have two functions. One is the, it, it modifies the pain transmission. The second is it also promotes wound healing. If you have pain, there is antidromic conduction of wound healing substances that come through back to the first order neurons and uh, increase the wound healing. So giving morphine into a, a, a knee joint or injecting into in, as an infiltration, all these act through peripheral opiate receptors. Coming to spinal effect, it is mediated in the level of substantial gelatinosa as we already saw. The first order neuron, when it uh, when it goes and uh, uh, synapses the second order neuron, there, there is a presynaptic and postsynaptic modulation that occurs at the spinal level. Coming to the supraspinal level, the main area that modulates this is called the periaqueductal gray matter. So all these analgesic effects are more effective in a second pain. That first pain means the cutting pain, which is conducted through A delta fibers. The second pain is the deep, uh, slow pain, which is modulated through the C fibers. Opiates are very effective in uh, abolishing the second pain. And uh, the, uh, the particular speciality is that the touch, the, the, the temperature perception, all these are not affected. Only sensory modalities are affected. Coming to the supraspinal mechanism, we have, a, uh, in this picture, we have a first order neuron uh, um, synapsing at the level of uh, the spinal cord. From this, a uh, different type of, you know, all that the perception goes through spinothalamic tract. But here we have another parallel tract running this is called the ascending spinomesencephalic tract, 
which synapses at the medulla pons and mid midbrain it straight goes to the midbrain where it activates the periaqueductal gray matter in that place periaqueductal gray matter relays through encephalogenic neurons which will inhibit the gaba neurons which are tonically active in inhibiting the glutamate neurons which descend down so once this uh, glutaminergic neurons from the midbrain to medulla are activated they activate some places called rafe magnets ma magnus neurons which again descend down to the same uh, place where everything started so this rostral ventral medulla will again activate spinal encephalogenic neurons here the uh, the encephalins are secreted and they act presynaptic and postsynaptic so it is a loop from the pain it uh, ascend the pain pathway ascends one through the spinothalamic tract the other the spinal mesencephalic tract it activates the periaqueductal gray matter from there it descends down through the rostral ventral medulla to the spinal cord secreting uh, encephalins which will modulate or decrease the pain uh, perception this is how the supraspinal mechanisms are affected so how will you measure the, um, this analysis here? like we have uh, uh, bis monitor or eeg based monitors to monitor the effects of anesthetic agents we don't have any effective monitor for measurement of analysis here. there are two measures one is the uh, max sparing effect in the intraoperative period that is you can lower down the usage of inhaled anesthetics if you use high amount of opiates that is called the max sparing effect the other one is physiological parameters the tachycardia hypertension sweating with all this you can measure but do we have an objective measure of analysis here? Yes, we are developing a monitor called the Analgesia Nociception Index Monitor. The input for this is the heart rate variability. Suppose you give an incision and there should be tachycardia. If you keep can keep the tachycardia less and the respiratory, uh, they also say that the opioids reduce the respiratory changes in the RR intervals. So with this, they are monitoring the amount of analgesia that is given by the opioid. This is called Analgesia Nociception Index. The range should be between 50 to 70. So you can see here it is a slightly higher value which is seen here. So this monitor is the upcoming monitor. Soon we will also have like a BIS monitor, we will have an ANI monitor. Coming to the next one, sedation. It is because of the reduced acetylcholine output from the prefrontal cortex in the basal forebrain. That is why patients become drowsy after the opioids. But loss of consciousness can occur only at very high doses. But this loss of consciousness is unpredictable and inconsistent. Not everybody becomes very drowsy because of this opioids. Though it has got max firing effect, effects, burst suppression never occurs. And these drugs should never be used as sole anesthetic agents for reducing the consciousness. Coming to euphoria, that occurs at uh, uh, um, the nucleus accumbens level. So nucleus accumbens is under tonic control of the ventral tegmen areas with dop dopaminergic neurons. The opioids act both presynaptically and postsynaptically, reducing the dopamine on the nucleus accumbens and produce rewarding properties that help. That also is, has got a negative effect on us that patients become more dependent and tolerant on opioids. Pruritus is a very uh, irritating uh, thing which is uh, yet to be conquered. So it occurs through histamine release in case of morphine. It also occurs because of trigeminal nucleus stimulation and uh, also because of peripheral opiate receptor activation because uh, um, uh, different mechanisms are there. One specific drug to prevent pruritus is not there. We uh, They have uh, um, discovered many areas where this uh, opiates act and produce pruritus. Coming to management of pruritus, the most effective one is ondansetron and especially in case of uh, patients who have pruritus with, uh, with neuraxial opioids, opiate agonist antagonist like pentazosin, nalbufin and uh, uh, nal these drugs also can prevent the pruritus. And now research is into peripherally acting antagonists which can uh, re reverse these effects. Naloxin also can reduce pruritus but the problem is it will reduce analgesia also. Coming to muscle rigidity, we are all aware that when we give fentanyl, we are afraid of this woody chest. So this is because of stimulation of mu receptors in the striatum. They increase the dopamine levels and decrease GABA, like how it occurs in cases of Parkinsonism. So because of this, patients will have woody chest, a lead pipe trunk and adducted local cord. So you will find it very difficult to ventilate when you give. So this uh, muscle rigidity will develop depending on 
the opiate used if you use fentanyl it's much more if it is less in uh, morphine the speed of injection of of, uh, of the drug and use of concomitant drugs so low doses of muscle relaxant propofol treated with benzodiazepine all this can reduce the muscle rigidity but whenever we have this we have to be careful because quickly the patient will start to desaturate and we have to be very careful in patients who have parkinsonism because the rigidity is very high in these patients coming to myosis i think uh, uh, this is the first slide which i have put it's a common feature with to all this myosis and constipation will always occur in all these patients sir so coming to myosis uh, here we have edinger westphal nucleus in the midbrain and uh, this edinger westphal nucleus will will uh, has an afferent path from the light and the inhibitory neurons and the efferent pathway goes through parasympathetic nerves in the ciliary ganglion and it will uh, innervate the sphincter pupillae so light causes myosis if the light activates sedinger westphal nucleus it will cause constriction of pupil and uh, hypocarbia hypercarbia hypoxia all this will produce uh, midriasis sir opiates inhibit the uh, in, uh, inhibitory neurons and produce a uh, high amount of myosis even low doses of uh, opiates they cause myosis and uh, it was first thought that myosis is proportional to the analgesia so they developed some monitors called a pupillometer i wanted to show this video but it's not there with me now this pupillometer as you give a opiate the my the myosis myosis will start to increase sir. and with this they have developed a index called the pupil and unrest under ambient light the, that is a pal index which can tell you how much of analgesia is derived from a particular opioid effects on respiratory system the all the inputs and outputs from the respiratory system are inhibited the from one from pons the bree bodzinger complex the cortical regions opiates can block everything so rate and depth of the uh, respiration is decreased on administration of opioids there is a reduced response to carbon dioxide and hypoxia also but on the positive side we have an antidepressive effect and that also blunts the stress response to intubation coming to cns effects as with the all other anesthetic agents they reduce the cerebral metabolic rate and cmro2 and uh, a specific effect a different one which uh, from the inhaled anesthetic is that it can reduce the cerebral blood flow uh, when you give inhalation anesthetics the decrease in cerebral blood flow is more prominent it does not have any effect in icd though we think that giving an opioid and patient becoming sedative his hypercarbia might increase icd that effect is actually not seen and uh, the delta and kappa activation can produce some amount of neuroprotection in ischemic brain models coming to cvs effect there's no significant effect of contracted this is the basis for using high opioid anesthesia in cardiac anesthesia in the previous years now it is not used and uh, sometimes because of the reduction in the cns output it also can produce bradycardia but all opioids have got some amount of anti arrhythmogenic effect and it has no got no coronary uh, circulation effect there's no stale phenomenon in any of the opioids we are using so it is very safe to use in all the cardiac patients sir and uh, like how we saw neuro protection kappa mediated bradi protection is also there they have got some amount of pre conditioning and post conditioning effects coming to effects on gat the uh, very disturbing effects the main thing is nausea and vomiting there are delta receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone located in the area prostrima of the floor of the fourth ventricle all these opioids can stimulate this chemoreceptor trigger zone and produce vomiting and uh, the transmission involves complex dopaminergic cholinergic and serotonergic pathways that is why one drug is not uh, uh, useful in preventing nausea and vomiting it is also aggravated by movement the inputs from the middle ear they come and uh, if you have given a opioid anesthetic in the patient you move the patient here and there he will start to vomit more and uh, the other interesting thing is the high doses of uh, these opiates itself they will inhibit the vomiting center that is why uh, when we give very high amount of fentanyl vomiting is depressed also preoperative ondansetron and dexamethasone have been uh, shown to be effective but not completely the other uh, uh, distressing effect is the biliary spasm it is because of the contraction of sphincter of od it produces biliary colic i still remember uh, when i used high dose opioids for ercp the the surgeon could not cannulate the sphincter of od and go into the uh, injector die so he uh, he was asking what is the opioid use how can he reverse it 
so that much of uh, contraction it can produce sir. and uh, 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 calculus in uh, calculus pancreatitis you can use morphine there is no evidence that uh, it, it produces more uh, colic and this bilirubin spasm is fully reversed by naloxone specifically pethidine cannot be reversed by naloxone other agents are glucagon ntg atropine all this can reverse if you look into what which drug produces maximum bilirubin spasm it is a fentanyl and buterphenol produces the least amount of bilirubin spasm opioid induced bowel dysfunction so these mu receptors are widely distributed we saw they are distributed in the cns they are distributed in the enteric nervous system also this will inhibit the bowel movement so this causes delayed gastric emptying and contraction of bowel sphincters which will directly produce constipation so this is because of the depressed coronary movement and increased water absorption on the other side good side they have been used as anti diarrheals but in patients who have cancer or on chronic opioid therapy it will have a distressing problem with them and there is no tolerance even if you give them for 2 years the uh, constipation will remain so now we are developing peripheral opioid antagonists uh, to, uh, for uh, tackling this uh, opioid uh, bowel dysfunction without reversing the analgesia the three drugs in this class are methylnaltrexone naloxigol and alvimopan methylnaltrexone naloxone is uh, only a parenteral agent it can be given subcutaneous od 12 mg for chronic opioid patients or uh, who are treated for cancer naloxigol is an oral agent it can be given 12.5 to 25 mg per oral and that also can be given for patients on chronic opioid therapy alvimopan is a new agent it is not effective orally but it is extensively studied for treating patients who are having post operative ileus because of high dose opioid in the intraoperative period so these three drugs are peripherally acting opioid antagonists opioids in obstetrics so they are totally not teratogenic the variety of animal studies have been done they are not teratogenic you can easily use them in patients who are posted for oocyte retrieval and the uh, thing is they can uh, yeah, aggravate the hypotension due to aortic aortic compression because of the vasodilatation so you have to be careful when you use them in the uh, cesarean section when you put spinal anesthesia and they can be transferred into the fetus and this particularly increases when there is fetal acidosis this is where all these agents uh, have different amount of fetal transfer but whatever you give definitely the fetal fetus will go have some amount of respiratory depression and you will have to be ready with the pediatrician to try to tackle that and when breastfeeding definitely it will be concentrated in the milk but uh the neonatal effects are minimal they, they say that pethrin has got the least effect here after 16th week uh, any fetus will uh, have some amount of pain so you have to give analgesia for the fetus when you do a fetal surgery they have found that even instilling uh, sufentanil into the uh, uh, amniotic fluid will give amount, some amount of analgesia in the fetus when you have a fetal surgery and mothers who are opioid dependent uh, when they have deliver a baby and suddenly the baby is withdrawn from the opioid they will develop neonatal abstinence syndrome with irritability cry so that that, uh, that will also have some amount of uh, uh, cardi- cardiac effects and it could be dangerous for the child coming on immunity like how there are uh, opioid receptors in the git there are also uh, opioid receptors in the immune cells so they are mod- modulated by the mu receptors and morphine has the greatest immune suppressive effects it is reflected as delayed wound healing the fibroblast uh, coming into the wound and healing that is delayed and they have also found that uh, patients who are on opioid based uh, anesthetic during a cancer surgery or comparing with the patients who are on a, a neuroaxial block uh, uh, cancer surgery the, the regression as uh, the progression of cancer is more in patients who have under had a opioid in the intraoperative period coming to pharmacokinetics now we are all using drugs which are uh, alpha uh, uh, which are mu agonists so there is not much difference between all these drugs uh, but uh, when you choose a drug it is always based on pharmacokinetics uh, so we have uh, under will uh, have a little understanding on what happens when a drug is administered it when it is given intravenously it fills the central compartment that is plasma that is the the central command compartment is filled first then what happens is this drug goes into a rapidly equilibrating compartment and the effect site in the in the next phase 
then slowly it goes into the slowly equilibrating, equilibrating compartment. So the onset of drug is dependent on the effect site concentration or CE. That depends on the plasma concentration, the central compartment CP. The plasma protein binding, if it is highly protein bound, it will not let it to the effect site. Uh, and the next, third thing is lipid solubility. If it is highly lipid soluble, it can escape the plasma protein binding and it can move into the effect site. And the amount of unionized fraction, which is available to cross into the biophase and produce the effect. The duration of bolus which you give depends on rate of elimination. This is the, called the Q factor. The rate of elimination will depend how long will the bolus produce an effect. The infusion rate depends on the volume of distribution and steady state. But what do we mean by steady state? So once you give the drug, it will fill the central compartment. It will go into the rapidly equilibrating compartment and the effect site. Then it will slowly move into the slowly equilibrating compartment by the time the drug concentration of central compartment will greatly reduce. So it is in, uh, in this phase, you will have to keep replenishing the drug which is moving into the, all these compartments that is called a steady state. The, uh, the infusion rate depends on volume of distribution of steady state and terminal elimination. So coming to the general properties of uh, the opioids, all opioids are weak bases. They dissociate into the, at the physiological pH, they dissociate into base form and a proteinated form. So given morphine sulfate, it will come be either in the base form, which is morphine sulfate itself, or into a proteinated form, which is morphine plus C. Only the unionized non-protein bound form penetrates in the biophase and produces the onset of action. So let us look at this chart and understand the pharmacokinetics of individual drugs. See the PKA, when it moves farther away from 7.4, the unionized fraction is very, very less. Look at fentanyl. We always thought fentanyl is a very wonderful drug, but see the PKA of fentanyl is 8.4 and the unionized fraction at pH is very, very low. Whereas, look at this alfentanil, it is near the physiological pH and the amount of unionized drug at the physiological pH is very, very high for alfentanil and remifentanil. This has got clinical implications, which we will see in the next slide. And uh, next, coming to the octanal water partition coefficient that determines the amount of liquid solubility, so fentanyl score first here. We already saw that there is a sulfur molecule in its nucleus that will produce high amount of lipid solubility. Morphine is the least lipid soluble or highest water soluble drug. So that also has got implications on how these drugs behave. Coming to plasma protein binding, the least plasma protein binding will have the maximum uh, uh, diffusion into the FX site. So though morphine has got some negative uh, factors, this uh, reduction in plasma protein binding will, will increase its diffusible fraction into the biophase. Whereas uh, sufentanil has got high amount of plasma protein binding. Coming to the clinical correlate. Look at this. If you give all drugs together and uh, look at how these drugs uh, achieve high concentrations in the effect side, you can see that highly unionized fractions of alfentanil and remifentanil allow quick effect side concentrations. So see here, the bolus has started. The first uh, uh, concentration uh, rise will occur only with alfentanil and remifentanil. They increase very highly, produce a rapid effect. So, if you suppose if you want to attenuate the stress response to an intubation, these drugs are the best drugs. When you give it together with the induction, alfentanil and remifentanil will produce good amount of uh, effect and it will quit the area also. So, this is how they behave. Coming to high lipid solubility of sufentanil and fentanyl, they start late, but the effects are very sustained. So whenever you give fentanyl as an anesthetic, as a part of an anesthetic, you will have to wait for at least five minutes for effect side concentrations to rise and the effect to come. So yeah, immediately this fentanyl effect will not come. And another thing about the high lipid solubility is that fentanyl is actively taken up into the lungs. Uh, once you inject, Quickly, it will go on for 85 percent will fill the lungs and then only slowly release. So you can see that the concentration high reaches high in the at the fifth minute and it slowly comes down because of the release, slow release from the lungs. Coming to morphine, morphine achieves the effects of concentration only after 20 minutes. So if you are giving morphine as an anesthetic, you have to really wait very long time. And because of the higher ionized fraction, 
it binds to the receptor very nicely and its effects last longer see here for the morphine the effects has started to come only after 10 to 15 minutes but the effects keep rising as the time goes out coming to the three compartment model kinetics and uh, looking at how these drugs behave in, in infusion you can see that remifentanil has the shortest half life in the first phase that means that once you inject remifentanil immediately it will start to go into the effect site and start producing its effect and it has got very less amount of volume of distribution also whereas if you use fentanyl infusion it will take some time to uh, the effect to come but at the same time it will last longer also where you have to be careful when you stop the infusion so when you come to the uh, the yes, uh, giving an infusion see this remifentanil has instantaneously produced a effect site concentration whereas fentanyl will produce a very it will actually be distributed uh, because of its lipid solubility and its protein binding it will be widely distributed it will take a very long time to actually produce analgesia so you will always have to give a bolus when you give a fentanyl and then only start an infusion directly starting fentanyl infusion will never give you any help coming to how these drugs behave after stopping an infusion this is called context sensitive half time which means after a very long infusion when you stop the infusion how long the drug effects start to come down so this is given by this back end kinetics diagram you can see here however long if you give rem remifentanil once you stop the infusion the remifentanil concentration will immediately go down whereas see look at fentanyl as the duration of uh, fentanyl infusion has increased if you, if you give for a very long time it takes very very long time for the fentanyl concentrations to come down in the body so once you stop the fentanyl infusion at least for 6 to 7 hours you have to monitor the patients carefully which is not the case of remifentanil coming to some pharmacology of individual drugs first we will talk about uh, the tramadol hydrochloride which is commonly used it is a racemic re mixture of both levo and uh, r forms uh, all these drugs will act only in pure form either the l or r form but here this is a racemic mixture and the pharmacological effects depend on 50 50 percentage of l and r forms the analgesic effect of both forms come with different mechanism of action one form uh, is a pure you want to see this uh, the, the other part is through the inhibition of serotonin and oral uptake. So the, the different of uh, different characteristics of tramadol is that it can uh, it's a very good analgesic. And because of the noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibition, it can also produce some amount of uh, antidepressive effects and it can elevate the mood. So though it is less potent than morphine, it, the analgesic effect because of these two mechanisms is very good. The tramadol effect is dependent on CYP2D6 for its effects. It means that tramadol is a pro-drug. Once you give it, liver has to metabolize into active metabolites and then only it can be uh, become an active congener. So the CYP2D6 is, uh, is, has a variety of heterology in uh, different individuals. That is why in one patient's tramadol may be very effective. The CYP2D6 is active. The tramadol is very active and some patients it might not be effective and produce more side effects. And uh, this drug has got high amount of nausea and vomiting. And now they, have, they are finding that it has high antibacterial activity. That is why the use of tramadol in, in epidural is increasing because they have shown that this drug has high antibacterial activity. And you have to be very careful when giving tramadol to patients who are taking SSRIs because it can precipitate serotonin syndrome, which is very dangerous. So psychiatric patients give very uh, tramadol uh, very carefully. Better to avoid it. They may produce a uh, uh, lot of dysphoria effects. And on the other hand, they can also land up in serotonin syndrome. Coming to buprenorphine hydrochloride, the thebine derivative is highly lipophilic. As we already saw in the classification, it is a mu receptor partial agonist, whereas in the kappa receptor, it's a pure antagonist. It is 33 times more potent than morphine, but the activity is less than morphine. It also binds tightly to the receptors. If you see the TFKEO for fentanyl, it's only six minutes. That is, the, uh, the fentanyl will unbound from the receptor within six minutes. But once buprenorphine binds to its receptor, the mu receptor, 
it takes 166 minutes for its unbounding from the receptor so it becomes long acting it does not a slow onset it peaks in 3 hours but the duration of its action is 10 hours that is why in the they are adding this drug into the uh, spinal epidural and the nerve blocks and it has also got a, a ceiling effect for respiratory depression because it's a partial agonist up to 3 microgram per kilogram it behaves like morphine above that the respiratory depression does not ever occur the kappa receptor antagonism produces some amount of antidepressant effect also these are the positive effects of buprenorphine hydrochloride coming to pentazosin lactate in one era where we didn't have uh, uh, fentanyl we were using pentazosin as the, the chief anesthetic agent it is a kappa receptor agonist and it is less potent than morphine at the mu receptor it might act slow lightly act as a as a uh, agonist but most of them it is an antagonist at the mu receptor the analgesic can respiratory depression have a ceiling dose at around 70 mg the normally each ml contains 30 mg if you give 2 ml and after that there is no respiratory depression after that respiratory depression will not ever occur and sometimes physical dependence may develop even though it has got a dysphoric effect the chief characteristic of this drug is it stimulates the sympathetic system and increase the catecholamine output so there will be some amount of tachycardia increase in svr bp and contractility this is uh, actually mediated by the delta receptors in the heart and it, uh, as i already told you uh, this agonist antagonist drugs have got some amount of antiprotetic effect if you use them with the uh, spinal fentanyl so the spentazosin has been shown to be really effective when there is uh, pruritus when you use spinal fentanyl coming to butafenol this is also a kappa receptor agonist and a mu antagonist it has got a rapid onset and peaks within one hour but the duration is only three hours excellent drug for giving in the post-operative period and this uh, drug also has, the, has got a ceiling effect of respiratory depression this also stimulates the uh, sympathetic system the characteristic feature is that it decreases the pulmonary pressure there have been reports of Patients developing pulmonary edema after butterfinal tartrate injection in the intramuscular period, the post operative time. Coming to nalbufin, it was al al almost a forgotten drug now. Again, it's being used. Apart from its kappa activity, it has also got some delta receptor activity. There's a quick concern and a long duration of action. Added with morphine therapy, it prevents the low dose of nalbufin. If you give it morphine therapy, it prevents dependence and tolerance. And it also prevents pruritus after neuroxyl opioids. Coming to sequential administration of agonist and antagonist, see, you might uh, have a, a opioid based anesthetic with a pure agonist. In the post operative period, you might like to give any of this agonist antagonist drug. Is it advisable that acute administration of agonist antagonist in opioid dependent patient will precipitate withdrawal because it will displace the uh, mu receptor agonist from that uh, receptor? Clinically, they should not be used for opioid reversal, but when you administer drug, these drugs for post operative pain relief, after pure agonist, you should be careful or it is not recommended because they are, the, the patient will be having good analysis and euphoria in that period. Suddenly administering a drug like morphine, a, a drug like butterfinal or nalbufin, the patient can have some dysphoria and reduction in the uh, analysis quality for some time. Coming to naloxone, it is a n allyl derivative of oxymorphone. It is a competitive antagonist and all opiate receptors, meaning if you have a pentazosin overdose or a buprenorphine overdose or even a nalbufin overdose, you can use it. It's not just for morphine and fentanyl alone. Administration into opioid on a naive patient, that is a patient who has not got opioid at all, it will increase the heart rate, it will reduce the food intake and altered sleep patterns and sometimes increase the BP in septic shock patients. Other than this, naloxone has got no discernible effects on patients who have not received any opioid. But if you, have, uh, if you uh, give it to a patient who has already received opioid, you can give it through intranasal route, IEM, whatever route you give it, it has got quick absorption from the injection site and it rapidly achieves concentration in CNS because of its allyl molecule in the allyl uh, nucleus and molecule in the nucleus. It becomes widely distributed and it starts to antagonize the effects of opioids. Liver also conjugates into maloxone 3 glucuronide, which is also an effective component. But the thing uh, you have to remember with naloxone is the clearance is very high and the effects last only for one hour. So if you suppose you're reversing an effect of morphine with naloxone, the, the, the patient will wake up faster. But after some time, it will again go into sleep. This is called re-narcotization. 
So you have to be very careful with this. So you have to have additional doses to, uh, to counter this, that effect. The usual dosage in, in, an, uh, in an emergency setting is 0.4 milligram to 0.8 milligram infusion over 10 minutes. Never give it in a direct bolus. Patient will have a sudden increase in uh, pain. So never give it as a direct bolus. Give it as an infusion over 10 minutes. Or two milligram, then maintain with the two milligram in 500 ml, ml that it will give a concentration of four microgram per ml at 100 ml per hour. You can also use it as 40 microgram bolus every two to three minutes. For newborns, if they have okay, given an uh, opiate to the mother and the newborn is depressed, you can use that 0.1 mg per kilogram bolus and repeated bolus till the child becomes fully awake. You what you have to be alert, uh, alert is rapid infusion can cause severe pain, tachycardia, sweating, myocardial infarction, arrhythmias, and pulmonary edema. Coming to the newer uh, things, normal delivery systems, we have neuraxial opioids and the delivery systems, transdermal therapeutic systems, oral transmucosal fentanyl, inotophoretic fentanyl, and extended release of the dipodure, epidural morphine. Uh, word about uh, neuraxial opioids. They are uh, classified into two di distinct types. One is the hydrophilic opioids and the lipophilic opioids. Hydrophilic opioid is the classic example is morphine. It has got slow onset when you give it in the uh, either in the spinal or in the epidural, but it has got a long duration of effect and it has got high CS of solubility. That is, it will not easily cross into the CNS very easily. It will stay in the uh, CSF and it will act and will produce extensive CSF. The advantages of these properties are a prolonged single dose analgesia, minimal dose compared with IV administration. Suppose if we give only 8 10 grams of morphine, that can be achieved with 1 to 2 milligram if it is given in the epidural. And thoracic analgesia with lumbar administration because it's extensively spread, even giving in the lumbar area will produce thoracic analgesia. The disadvantage is that it, the delayed onset is there and it has got an unpredictable duration. Sometimes morphine effect, we have seen up to 24 to 28 hours, morphine effect will be there. Higher incidence of side effects. And delayed respiratory depression. That is a very worry, uh, troublesome. Uh, we have given morphine at uh, in the morning, and sometimes patient becomes so sedated and respiratory depressed in the evening. So that is the problem with the morphine. Coming to lipophilic opiates, they have the advantage of rapid onset, short duration, and low CS of solubility. The advantage is that it can be ideally used in cases of uh, patient controlled epidural analgesia. But the problem is a uh, single dose will be very short duration. Systemic absorption will be there and it will cause all the pruritus, everything will come. And uh, if you give it uh, an epidural in the lumbar, thoracic canal, this will not be there if you use a lipophilic opioids. Uh, there is a different uh, uh, discovery uh, which is in the recent time uh, called the uh, nociceptin opioid receptor. The search for endogenous ligand led to nociceptin, which is a 17 amino acid peptide, which is widely distributed in the descending pain pathways. They have found that spinal injection of this nociceptin or orphanin FQ produces intense analgesia and systemic administration produces moderate analgesia without any side effects. So they are developing a, a nociceptin like ligand called Sibranopodol, which is a uh, which is which is class the phase one and phase two trials, and it is yet to go into the neuraxial opioid list. Coming to transdermal therapy system, we all have seen the fentanyl patches and buprenorphine patches. The characteristic which will make them use in that area is high lipid solubility, low molecular weight, high potential, no skin irritation. Only if these compounds have these four properties, they can be used. The advantages of these patches are there is no first pass metabolism, consistent analysis in the post operative period, and they're very convenient for the patient. Transmucosal delivery for these three drugs are there the fentanyl lollipop, buprenorphine sublingual tablet, and there is, this is called suboxone uh, sublingual film. This is commonly used for opiate-dependent patients. Uh, you might have all seen that uh, some patients, uh, da, they quickly respond to opiate therapy and some are uh, resistant. Uh, this is because of uh, a mutation called A1186 mutation in the chromosome 6, uh, which uh, uh, has a OPRM gene for mu receptor. So if these patients have these mutations, the drug effects uh, won't uh, occur easily, but the side effect profile will remain the same. Coming to biased agonism, morphine, when it's bind to mu receptor, it will activate G protein, as I have already told you. They also induce another compound called B arrestin, which will produce respiratory and decrease in respiratory function. 
Now they are into uh, finding new compounds that will only activate the G protein and produce analgesia without respiratory dysfunction and GA function. Mitragynin and uh, the Sibranopidol, they have new ligands that do not recruit beta arrestin. So th th this is the future of opioid therapy. Uh, coming to this, my meiotic uh, pupil, there is one interesting story which I read long, long ago uh, called Harmful Intent by uh, uh, Robin Cook. In that, the anesthetist named Jeffrey Rhodes, he will be uh, penalized for uh, uh, having a reckless uh, anesthetic course for a lady which dies in the, in, in the peripartum period. So the nurse will testimonize in the court telling that he was under the influence of opiates. I saw his constricted people. So the meiotic people will tell, uh, the jury will tell that he is uh, 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 under the influence of opiate in the perioperative period and he penalize him. So that is how the story goes. Thank you all. And uh, I think uh, the, this, uh, it is a very huge topic. Uh, so I have covered some important areas which you might not understand. Uh, so let this be a stimulus for you to read much more. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Professor, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you have presented it in a very interesting and a very understandable way. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, a few questions are not there. I will ask you some questions. So uh, regarding this uh, transdermal application, yes, whether sir. we can use in uh, acute uh, pain, that is post-operative pain, transdermal. Uh -huh. Sir, it takes some time for the effect to occur. So it should be ideally these uh, uh, patches should be pasted in the preoperative period so that once the patient comes out of anesthesia, they have a stable concentration of these drugs in the blood level. And once we remove it also, we have to be very careful. The fentanyl patches are notorious. Uh, they are the skin and succubinous tissue act as a, a depot for this fentanyl. So they will, even after removal of the fentanyl patches, their effect will be prolonged. So acute effects will not be uh, 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 there. We have to uh, put them in the preoperative period and after we remove also, we have to monitor these patients. Yes, sir. That was the my second question I thought. That is, the, you have to apply very earlier. There is a period of lag period. So you have to cover some other ana analgesia for this lag period of 24 hours. Suppose you are applying in the post operative period. So thank you very much, sir. Thanks, thank you. Sir. Uh, so we come to the uh, last session of today's uh, uh, today's session that is very interesting topic by Dr. Rajesh that is basics of echo what anesthesiologist should know. He is a professor of department of anesthesia and he is also acting as a medical superintendent in charge in the Indira Gandhi Medical College Research Institute Puducherry. He has more than 15 publications and he was the vice president of IAC Puducherry State in the year 12, 20, 20, 12 and 13. And he was the governing council member of IASA South Zone 2013. And he is the past president of IASA Bucheri State 2018. He is master in uh, trans esophageal echocardiography and ultrasound blocks and conducted many workshops. He has attended as faculty in many conferences and CME. He was the organizing chairman of many state and South Zone conferences of Puducherry. So we welcome you, sir. Over to you, Rajesh, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Am I audible? Is it clear, yes, sir? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, very uh, warm good morning to everyone on Sunday morning. Uh, today's session is on uh, basics of echocardiogram. This, uh, as uh, Dr. Edward Johnson sir has told me that we will be having two or three sessions on this echocardiogram. So what I have done today is to just give you an introduction to transthoracic echocardiogram what every anesthesiologist should know. Okay. So today's session, the objectives are the focus, point of care ultrasound. What is the meaning of focus? And what are all the different components of focus? And why anesthesiologists should know about transthoracic echocardiogram? Then what are the basic views? How to get those views? And once you get those views, what exactly uh, structures, what structures you have exactly to uh, recognize in those views. And then finally, to conclude, how to assess the LV systolic function, because that is the very basic thing which you need to know when you are doing echocardiogram. Okay. So to start with, what do you mean by focus? That is point of care ultrasound. We have been uh, listening to this word for the last uh, one or two decades. 
So basically, what does it mean is by utilizing the ultrasound, we are going to take care of a limited examination for a well-defined clinical question. That's the most important part. This question is uh, it should be well-defined to guide the patient management with the intention of patient, improving the patient outcome. Okay. So what are those questions? For an example, if you are dealing with the, uh, in your uh, in a pre-operative room, if you are assessing the patient, emergency patient, the question may be like uh, whether the patient's stomach is full. For this, you need to do a gastric ultrasound. Or in case a patient is not hemodynamically stable, we would like to do a transthoracic echocardiogram. You can just ask the question, whether the patient's LV function is good, or does this patient need more fluid, something like this. So these, once you frame these type of so for this question, you need to find the answer to uh, localized or focused examination. This is what is point of care ultrasound. But remember, this point of care ultrasound is just an extension of your clinical and uh, physical exam. That's a very important point. But we know that for the last two or three decades, we anesthesiologists have been using the ultrasound for a long time, especially for uh, uh, performing a lot of blocks and also to vascular access and many other like airway assessment and lung ultrasound, many things we are doing. So recently, this is the most important one, which I'm going to talk about, focused transthoracic echocardiogram. Okay. So what type of echocardiogram we are going to practice? Is it a comprehensive one or a focused one? No, we are not going to do a comprehensive uh, assessment of the, uh, through the echocardiogram, but we are going to do a, what is called as focused or goal directed echocardiogram. That is a point of care echo, what I have already did, uh, told. Why we anesthesiologists should be aware of this? Because this point of care ultrasound is being done by the treating physician. So if you are going to, if you are treating a patient who is hemodynamically unstable, uh, it does make sense that if you know how to do this echocardiogram, because the questions are going to be formed by you, especially when a patient who is deteriorating, you have to know that whether Am I doing anything wrong? Or what way I could inform or improve the patient outcome? So like uh, doing this transthoracic echocardiogram, you can analyze so many things which we'll be seeing in the subsequent time. And also a disclaimer here, but remember that the type of echocardiogram we are doing is a focused echocardiogram and it is not a comprehensive, so it cannot replace an echocardiogram done by the cardiologist in a very high end mission. This is only to improve or elevate the, or augment your physical exam. This is a very important point. And another thing is, uh, what are all the, why we should know? What are all the significance or what are all the importance of doing this transfer? First and foremost is, it gives you a quick and a reliable information. Because, uh, uh, for an example, if you want to do a chest, uh, chest x-ray, you need to wait for the radiographer to come to the patient by side. Then the film has to be developed. It may take at least minimum uh, 20 to 25 minutes. So you will be wasting a lot of uh, important time. But unlike that, you have a machine. If you have a machine in your hand, you are going to do immediately and you will find out the, what is happening in time. And second thing is, it does give you a real-time image. That means you are going to, you are seeing the image like how, as it happens. It's a real time. The third most important thing is non-invasive and most importantly, it, it is the evaluation done by the echocardiogram is dynamic. It means you are going to see the change for the treatment which you have started on. So that means it is not a one-time, it's not a static you know, uh, imaging modality like an ECG or a cystic ray. It is a dynamic one because uh, due to this, every one of us should be aware of how to do a basic transverse echocardiogram. But at the same time, remember, the point of care echo will tell you how to assess the qualitatively, not quantitatively. Of course, quantitatively also we can learn, but that's an advanced uh, technology. Uh, but as an anesthetist, we all should know qualitative assessment. Okay, as since this is a qualitative assessment, training and experience are very, very important. Okay, so having said that, with this introduction, we'll just move on to the topic. So, okay, let's start with the trans. What type of a transfuse that we should have? Because as an anesthetist, we are very much familiar with these two types of transfusion. You are high frequency linear probe as well as the closed linear probe. But for the for doing an echo, you need to have what is called as a phase array. So this is what is the phase array. You must have seen um, uh, if your uh, ultrasound machine does come, if it uh, come with the probe, just kindly examine that. 
this is the uh, phase two. The one important thing which you need to know in this is what is called as this orientation knot, either as a group or as a small knot. This plays very, very important because based the, for an echocardiogram, this plays this positioning of this orientation marker only defines the or defies the image which is going to be generated. And second thing is holding of the probe. How are you going to hold the probe? So this is some. This is the way you have to hold the probe. You do it like a pencil holding, and your palm should be touching the patient so that a firm pressure should be elicited on the thing. And there is a small uh, thing in this because this area has to be well covered with image. So because sometimes it may be very difficult to get an image because of the inadequate of the jelly. Because of the air interface, the images cannot be clear. So after applying the jelly, you have to pressure, uh, perform the. <coughs> So, produce a sort of a firm pressure on the patient and hold the probe. So, conventionally, the orientation marker, this denotes the orientation marker. Orientation marker comes to the right upper quadrant of the uh, frame, of the screen. So, conventionally, it will be like this. And uh, if it is not there, you have to change it. Only then, you are the basic images will not change. Okay. So, next is how to get an optimal image. So, there are two things are important. As in any other ultrasound modality, gain as well as the depth. So when you say gain, it is about the application of the image. Where uh, the you are here, the, all the cardiac structures will be seen as gray, something like this, and the blood will be seen as the black, and this white listening will be the pericard. But imagine if you are gain is not correct, you'll be getting the images like this, by which you will not be able to get any. The next thing is your idea depth because every image has got a marker for the marker points, which we will be telling, I will be telling you a little later. So, any unnecessary depth, for an example, this page shows you insufficient depth. Here, you may not be able to get information. Here, you are losing the uh, valuable area here by giving excess depth. So, you will not be able to analyze the image properly. So, because of this, because of this, you will be losing a lot of uh, uh, empty uh, space. So, because of that, so you have to make or you have to plan for perfect gain as well as the ideal depth. Okay. So, what are all the different imaging technology? Your thing, first thing start with there are three types of image. So, first is the 2D imaging, that is the basic mode, that is some, some of the machines will come out the nomenclature like the B mode. It allows the, it allows the image to be seen is the two-dimensional, this is the main state. And second thing is the M mode, which gives you only one direction for a So, this is the, this is a, this is the basis of the uh, B mode. So, imagine the cardiac is lying like this. And your ultrasound beam is going to intersect the uh, uh, cardia at three sections. Something like a sagittal or a long axis. This is the long axis. This is the long axis. And then one plane will be the short axis. The third will be the coronal section. So we will be studying the heart in these three sections in this 2D mode or a beam. Whereas in M mode, it will be seen, uh, the image will be studied in a, uh, against a moving object. In a, against the time. This is the image you will be getting. So, very especially useful when you are studying the valve. And third thing is the Doppler. Doppler is something like uh, to assess the blood flow velocity. Here we compare the frequency change between the transmitted one, that is the beam that is going generated, as well as the reflected sound. But we are not going to see these two things today. Maybe the next class we will be discussing about this utility of the M mode as well as the Doppler mode. Today we are going to see the only about this to be imaging. So, what are all the uh, views? When we talk about uh, the uh, any uh, echocardiogram, first thing you need to know how to get the image. So, for that you need to know what are all the views we need to do. So, there are three basic views. One is parastanal, another one, second one is the typical, third one is the sarcastic. Parastanal is divided into two views. One is the long axis where we are studying the heart in the long axis. Another one is the short axis. Then you have the epical. Epical, you will be having epical four chamber view, then epical five chamber view. In subcostal, we have the subcostal cardiac view as well as the subcostal IVC. So these are the basic views we all should know. Okay. So when we are talking about 
you, we should know how to put the probe, or rather where to put the probe to get the image. So for that, we know we know that since the heart lies inside the thoracic cage, it is covered by the lung. But we know that air yeah, is an enemy for the ultrasound, so that most of the places the ultrasound beam is not covered. So there are few areas which are called as acoustic windows. Through only in those areas, we will be able to analyze the image of the heart. So these are the images. The number one, as the name implies, is the parastomy. Because it just lies adjacent to the sternum, the left to the third or fourth intercostal space can have this the parastomal window. That's the number one. Then you have the epical window. Epical window is the at the epical impulse, at the place of the epical impulse. Then third is the subcostal window, that is one or two centimeters below the cystisternum. And then fourth is the supersternal notch. This, uh, but usually, conventionally, we don't practice this because it's an advanced, advanced uh, mode of uh, assessing. Okay. So now let's start with the parasternal long. So number first thing is how to position the patient. But you would have seen that cardiologists always perform the echo by this position. But we do not have or we may not have this type of x-ray unless we examine the patient in the preoperative. So most of the time, either on table or in the ICU or in the postoperative way, uh, a postoperative bed, you will not be able to make up this patient to this position. But however, if possible, this is the ideal position, patient lying to the left, left leg. And to get the parastatal long axis view, so you have to place the transducer in the second or third intercourse or up to Second to fourth, it may vary from patient to patient at the intercostal space. And the important point here is your the, this is the uh, orientation marker has to be facing has to be facing the right shoulder. This is very important. The uh, orientation marker has to face the right shoulder. By doing this, the ultrasound beam travels like this. So we know that the axis of the heart lies like this. So it just goes parallel. That sagittal plane of the heart is the bicep. So between the right shoulder, the plane should be between the right shoulder and the left. So when this beam is intersecting the heart, this is the one which we are talking about. It's a, a long axis plane. This is the one. This is the one which we are going to uh, study now. Okay. So when then imagine that this is the cut section of the heart. This is what you will be seeing in the echocardiogram. The one, this is the place which is closer to the screen because your probe comes, your beam comes like this. So as a result, this is what you will be seeing on the top of the image. The water seat is the right ventricular outflow track. Then you will get the interventricular septum. Then you will get the left ventricle. Then left atrium. Between the left atrium and left ventricle, you will be seeing the uh, mitral valve. Then you have the aortic valve, left LVOT, and the iota, part of the iota will be seen. So this is another image, and you will be seeing the pericardium at the uh, uh, lowermost part of the screen. So this is what exactly when you put the probe in the parastatal in the exact position, this is the image you will be seeing. The topmost part will be the right ventricle. Then you have the interventricular septum. Then you have the cavity, left ventricular cavity. Then you have the mitral valve. This is the anterior leaflet. Then here the since the mitral valve is open, aortic valve is closed. You have the iota starting up to some part of the tubular iota will be seen, and this is the descending. So, as far as the this flax image is concerned, this descending iota has to be included in the image, and this should form the lowest part of the your image because uh, uh, it will help you to differentiate between the pericardial and the coronary. Okay. So, what are the structures, and what are the interpretation you are going to do by doing this? Same thing, this right ventricle, you may not get better, any uh, uh, better information will be provided in other views. This in the view will not provide much information about the RV. But the most important thing is left ventricle. What is the size of the left ventricle and how do how does the function, how does it uh, function? Then you have the ascending iota, the size of the aortic iota, then the aortic valve, mitral valve, as well as pericardium. These are the uh, stru uh, structures which you can analyze in this image and you can interpret. Okay, we'll move on to the image. So this is the image, or this is how the your flax view will be seen. So you can see this is the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the LV cavity. Your mitral valve is moving, closing, and opening and closing. This is the aortic valve, and this is your LA, and here is your descending. Okay, let me pause this image.
So if you see, so when your mitral valve is opened, you will be able to see the closure of the mitral. So in the information, what you can get, you can see the mitral valve is opening that. So to some extent, you can rule out that this patient does not have any stenosis of the valve. Same way, when the aortic valve is open, so this is the aortic valve is well open. So you can rule out the cause to some extent, even though there are various methods by which you can analyze the mitral, uh, you can pick up the genotic valve. This will just give you a crude uh, uh, idea about whether this patient has got this very stenotic patient. Okay. So, also you can analyze how the uh, LB functions. So next is your parasternal short axis. So parasternal short axis is the, here we are going to study the heart in the short axis, where at four different levels, starting from the cephalod, you have the aortic level, then comes down the mitral level, then the mid papillary level, then epithelial. There are four A levels at which yeah, in track parasternal short axis view, we will be studying the heart. So how to get the image? This is the image which we have discussed earlier where we are going to see the heart in the long, long, I mean, uh, long axis. So what you need to do is just rotate the probe 90 degrees, the rectangle, so that the orientation marker is facing the patient left shoulder. So the approximately around 2 o'clock position. And by doing this, you will be getting the heart in the cross section, that is your short axis. So what are, how the image will look like? This is what, so if the image is on the, cephalot side, you will be getting what is known as an aortic level. Then as you keep coming down or as you sweep the image or beam down, so you just start looking down like this. So you will be getting your mitral, then mid papillary, then epical level. So at each level, we can study various structures. So this is your, this is the your aortic level. This is the aortic valve. Like this is the aortic valve. You have <coughs> You have the right atrium here, then you have the tricuspid valve will come here. This is right ventricle, and this is the interatrial septum, and this is the left atrium. And you will not see the left ventricle in this image because you are seeing the image. Imagine that you are seeing above the left, left ventricle. So, as the image, as you start looking into the, uh, imagine you have started looking into the left ventricle, starting from the left atrium. So, now you are seeing this. This is your you have started seeing your right ventricle here and this is the mitral valve apparatus started coming into picture. Your mitral valve starts opening up, opening and closing. So now you are just looking into the left ventricle. So as you move further, you start uh, uh, looking the probe, looking or flipping the probe down, you start getting your papillary muscle. This is a mid papillary view. So now papillary muscles start coming into the picture. So now it's a mid papillary view. This so you are seeing the papillary muscle. Okay. So once you are familiar with this uh, parasternal short axis view, then we will move on to the uh, fourth chamber. So what you have to do here? Imagine that. Uh, remember that in the parasternal short axis view, we have kept the transducer at third or fourth intercostal space and our uh, pointer was marking or the orientation marker was pointing towards the left shoulder. So here what you need to do is you have to come down a little bit below or if you are able to localize the patient epical impulse, that is the place where you keep the probe for obtaining the epical four chamber view and the orientation marker has to be pointed <laughs> towards the <laughs> three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Three o'clock position. Yeah, Panjam Bhagata. There is a <coughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. So the position of the orientation marker has to be in the, the towards the three o'clock. So at this time the plane, that uh, beam of the uh, ultrasound beam, the plane has to be traveling like this. It will be the coronal section. It will be, I mean, uh, in, it bisects the heart in the coronal section. And another tip here, you should not look too much down, too much down. It will be a little bit tilted upwards. Uh, that is uh, aimed superiorly and medially towards the right scapula. That will give you an ideal image. Yeah. 
So this is of the, the uh, your coronal plane bisecting, and this is the image you are going to see. Okay. So this is how the image will be coming. This is the top of the screen, and the one which is on your right is your left ventricle, and one on the left will be the right ventricle. And below this is the right atrium, and below this, below the left ventricle is the left atrium and corresponding valves, mitral valve and right ventricle. This is the image where you will be seeing all four chambers in a uh, good way. So this is how the image will be seen. Left ventricle on the, on the right side, right ventricle on the left side, right atrium and the left atrium. So what are we going to see? This is very important. Uh, even though with the next uh, section, next session, we will be discussing about each and everything. But uh, to just for the completion uh, sake, you need to understand. Here, you need to compare the size of the right and the left ventricle. We know that always left ventricle is bigger in size. That should be the normal. If the right ventricle size is uh, bigger than the left ventricle, then that's a problem. Then I have the left atrium. Then mitral valve. Mitral valve studies, the, uh, studies can be done here. Same way, right atrium and uh, tricuspid valve also can be studied first. And uh, the regurgitin and stenoarticulations can be studied here. Okay. So once this four chamber view is done, then what are we going to do to get to the uh, left ventricular uh, or five chamber view? You just tilt the, the same place from where the four chamber view is assigned. They're from the same place. You just lift the uh, probe anterior superior. So you will be seeing the LVOT and the aortic. And uh, from this view, you will start getting the aortic LVOT with the aortic valve. And uh, this is the fifth chamber. That's why it's called A5C, aortic five chamber. Okay. Aorta is the fifth chamber. So this is the four chamber view. So you see the left ventricle is bigger than the right ventricle. You clearly see the mitral valve opening and closing. This is the left atrium. This is the uh, right atrium. Tricuspid valve is not clearly seen in this image, but you need to adjust the your probe and uh, you'll be getting it. Once you start tilting the probe anteriorly, little bit anterior uh, superiorly, you will start getting the opening up of, you'll start getting the uh, aortic valve. So this is how the aortic valve will be seen. LV voting, the aortic valve. This image will be used to study a very advanced, especially the cardiac volume uh, calculation, stroke volume calculation. For this, this image will be very Okay. So once these views are done, next we'll move on to the subcostal. So the subcostal view is a very, very important view because the practically what we have seen is, especially when the patient is in the ICU, you may not be able to get those views, flax view or uh, uh, short axis view, especially if the patient is on ventilator, very difficult. You may not get the ideal views of all the views, ideal images in the, all the views, but you have to uh, do all the views and then you have to correlate the function. And uh, most of the patients getting a subcostal view is very, very easy because uh, it doesn't penetrate through the lungs. It does penetrate through the liver because liver is reasonably a better medium. So uh, this image will give you many information which you will not be able to get during your regular views in the eyes. So for this, what we need to do is place the probe in the around sub cephoid region, around one or uh, I mean, or two to three centimeter below the cephoid sternum, you place the probe and uh, orientation marker has to be at the three o'clock. Another thing with the important point here is, unlike the uh, the holding of the probe, so normally I, I have already told you that you have to hold the probe like this so that your form is sitting on the patient, uh, patient. But here, if you do that, you will not be able to get the image. So what you need to do is you have to do what is called as a form down grip. That is, you hold the probe like this, and then insert something like that. So there should not be the entire probe should be lying below your form. You have to do it like this, not like this. So only then you will be getting the images. So when you do this, this uh, the bay, this beam penetrates or bisects the heart in the coronal plane, and the image will be like this. What is the superior most part of the image is the liver, and this is the conduction medium. Through this, we will be analyzing the heart, and the same way, like a apical four chamber view, what is coming here is the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and this is the tricuspid valve, and this is the uh, your right atrium, this is the left atrium, this is the mitral valve. So what are we going to see assess in this? Same way, the, all the image, whatever uh, 
I was talking about the ethical uh, for chamber review, you will be able to do this. But one thing is, sometimes you will not be able to do the uh, Doppler studies in this because it is not uh, exactly aligned. This uh, Doppler is not aligned. So, to completion, to complete the uh, subcostal view, we need to get the IVC. For this, from the uh, orientation marker, from the 3 o'clock position, you rotate the transducer 90 degree to the counterclockwise so that your orientation marker is placed at the 12 o'clock. And uh, by doing this, always keep the right atrium in the view because you have to make sure that the uh, IVC drains into the right atrium. Otherwise, you will mistake the IOTA for that anytime it happens. So, always make sure that when you are analyzing the IVC, which uh, most of us are well aware, and analyzing it, always bring the right atrium into the uh, picture. And uh, this is the uh, IVC. Okay, so once you get all these views, so first you know what you need to do is you have to keep practicing it how to get the image. But as I already told you that it is very difficult to get images, all the images in all the patients. Some patients you may not be able to get the uh, long axis view, some patients the short axis view and the apical four chamber it not be possible. So subcostal view, so you have to try doing all the views and whatever the information you are uh, you are getting from each views have to be put together and to make a uh, 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 interpretation as a whole. Okay. So before completion, I would like to know how to do a left ventricular systolic function. So whenever we talk about echocardiogram, what comes to our mind is the ejection function, correct? Because um, the once we know that, uh, especially during the preoperative uh, assessment, if the, if the patient uh, does come with a record report, and first thing which we look is EF. If the EF is 55, we are happy. If the EF says that 40, okay, 30, we are not very happy. So, but there are a lot of pitfalls uh, are there by relying just by looking at the EF numbers. Because this EF number is a, a fallacy. It will not give you much information. That you will know once you start doing the uh, echocardiogram on the phone. Because most of the ejection fraction reports that is given in the echo report is based on what is called as a Pickles uh, method. It is not an approved method. Either uh, otherwise, you have to do the echo, I mean EF calculation by what is known as modified Simpson methodology. But it since it's very time consuming, most of the reports come with Pickles report, Pickles uh, method. Because the Pickles method, we analyze the ejection fraction. At, the, at only one point of the left ventricle. So, if the patient has got any abnormal regional wall motion abnormality beyond that point, that will not be picked up. So, inadvertently, this EF will give you a very pseudo high band. Or, <coughs> in other words, relying the uh, LV function only based on only on EF is not very much acceptable. So, for this reason, you have to assess the LV. It's a qualitative method. So, how are we going to analyze the uh, LV function in a qualitative way? So, for this, uh, especially in the bedside, when you are practicing a bedside echocardiogram, you need to follow what is called as an eyeballing technique. Yeah. Many reports have, or many uh, studies have clearly proven that this eyeballing technique is as equal, or, or rather, uh, e as equal to the interpretation done by the cardiac. As far as this ejection fraction. Uh, uh, terminology is concerned. Okay. So, what are we going to look at the left ventricle in the eyeballing? Case? There are three important points we have to analyze. The first one is the, the change in the volume of the chain between systole and diastole. So, this side you have the diastolic one, it's a parastinal long axis. I, I am sure that by this time you would have recognized the view. Uh, this is the your diastolic one, this is the systolic. So, uh, just see how the chamber size is differing between these two. So entirely, there is a nearly about more than 60 percentage of the chamber is constricted or the contracted during systole. That's a good sign. The first, that's the first thing which you need to assess. The second thing is the what is the change in the thickness of the wall, either the uh, ventromatical septum or the uh, free wall. So you should be the thickness should change more than 60 percentage between the during the system. So during the system, the wall has to get thickened. That's the second thing which we need to uh, look into. The third thing is your anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This mitral valve anterior leaflet has to go towards the interventricular system. 
how far it moves or how close it moves to re to touch the interventricular system that will give you an important aspect or I mean important idea about the left ventricular. So when you are analyzing or qualitatively analyzing the uh, left ventricular function, these are the three points you will uh, points by which you will be able to. So I'll just put you in another image where uh, here you can see. So by applying the same principle. A look at the difference between the chamber volume difference between systole and diastole. Only there is any difference. Even the systole, it is the same. And what happens to the thickness change? There is hardly any change in the thickness. And it is hardly, the, your anterior liquid hardly cross the midway. So if your image is going to be like this, then you can be very well clear that this patient has got poor LG systolic function. We don't, whether, whether we are not very uh, bothered about whether it is 30 or 28, or 25, but we know that this patient has got poor LG systolic function. Okay, before completing, let me give you some example. So this is the flax view, which uh, the the basic view everyone should start uh, doing and know that. So by looking at this, you apply the same three principles here. Just and I'll see how the Just see this now. So the chamber volume is getting uh, between the system and diastole, it's completely getting constricted, and, and the vessel, I mean, the, your walls, three walls as well as the septum is getting contracted, thickened, getting thickened well, and the mitral valve just goes and uh, comes near the uh, So that means the, this patient's LV function is reasonably it's good. So we'll go to the next one. Just see this patient. This assess how the compared to the previous one, this is not doing well. So that means this patient, by looking at this image, you can say this patient has got moderate LV dysfunction. Look at the third one. There is hardly any movement. There is no change in the dimensions of the chamber. And uh, mitral valve is not at all moving. And uh, there is no thickness change in the. So, if you see this type of an image, you know very much, you'll be very much sure that this patient has got very poor LD and you can plan your anesthetic technique for it. Okay. So, to complete, so at this session, so you would have known how to get the parastinal long axis view and how to identify each structure in this view, as well as the parastinal short axis view and the epical four chamber as well as the epical five chamber view and the your uh, subcostal okay so in the next session we will be seeing what is the uh, how do you do the diastolic function assessment how to assess the right ventricle how to identify the significant valvular lesion especially the stenotic lesion which are very important for anesthetic management then how to identify regional valve motion abnormalities if time permits we will go and see the calculation of the stroke volume and how to use this uh, most importantly once you know all these things then subsequently we will see how to use this trans thoracic echocardiogram uh, during AFN for a patient who is hemodynamically unstable through different protocols especially the 5E with a lot of videos we will I'll meet you in the next session thank you very much thank you Rajesh your astonishing presentation your uh, videos are awesome and your presentation and your explanation and teaching is more than that. So we are expecting Thank more you, classes sir. from you, sir. In Thank the future, you, sir. this is the beginning, I think. Yes, so we, we are expecting eagerly waiting for your classes in the future also. So, Prasad, sir, any questions? No, sir. It was very enlightening talk, sir. Very nice one, sir. Slow, yes. steady, as usual. You are very uh, firm in your uh, uh, giving delivering the talk, sir. Thank you, Rajesh. Sir. Thank you, Shivaj. Thank you, Rajesh. Sir. It was wonderful. Thank you. Very nice uh, slides and very nice videos, sir. So, in we are really lucky to have you in our session, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other sessions also, sir.
I have to thank the today's uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Sopasa sir, Dr. Partha Sarathi sir, and Dr. Rajesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will meet in the future also. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Shilpa, thank you. And uh, I also thank the, today's uh, Anasisia TV. First time they are streaming the, our presentation in the throughout worldwide. So I thank the Anasisia TV also. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will meet the next day.